So let me just real quickly show you some pictures. The reason this stuff happens, all these things we've talked about, is there are six pieces to the puzzle. Now this makes it incredibly challenging to try to figure it out. Because this is all not this A plus B equals C. A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F sometimes equals 100, and sometimes it's only 22. So just when you think you know, you don't know. The things that are really important to know about and think about when you're either trying to visit or solve problems, what type and amount of dementia is the person experiencing in that moment? In other words, what's going on with their dementia? You need to understand one size does not fit all. There's lots of different types. There's over 80 to 90 time, types and variations of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common, but even within Alzheimer's now, we now think there's probably about five different variations of Alzheimer's. It's not all one anymore. We're starting to understand. There's young onset, there's late onset. There's a component of Alzheimer's that's more frontal. There's a component of Alzheimer's that's more occipital, in other words, vision oriented. We're starting to realize that this disease, although we know it, we don't know it as well as we thought we did. We're still learning about it. And there's 80 to 90 different types of dementia. So Alzheimer's is only one of many. You can have more than one. You can have Alzheimer's plus vascular, you can have Lewy body, you can have frontal lobe, you can have AIDS-related dementias. All types of dementia. We need a lot more going on in understanding this, but also in appreciating what kind you might be dealing with, because it does matter. And how far along in the disease are they? You also want to know the person, who they've been, what's their history, what's their story, what are life events that might have shaped them. How did they go about doing things? What's their personality traits? Are they an introvert or an extrovert? It's really vital to know about introverts versus extroverts. Introverts are people who need time alone every day. They are very sensitive about personal space, intimate space issues, belongings. They're very territorial as the disease progresses. Extroverts love being around people, need to be around people, must be around people, and they, 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 and they go, they go, 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 go. They think with their mouth running, and so late in disease, they're gonna tend to chatter or make noise. Here's the problem. If you're an introvert caregiver caring for an extrovert, <laughs> I need you to shut up for five minutes. <laughs> Do you hear me? You just go in the other room and shut up. And you never thought you would say that to somebody you love, but all you want is peace and quiet for five minutes. Well, why do you want me to go in the other room? Because I need time. Well, don't you love me? Yes, I love you, but go away. <laughs> An extrovert doesn't understand that when they get dementia. They view it as rejection. So they need somebody else to be with. Because if they can't be with you, they've got to be with somebody, and they can't be with you all the time. You're an introvert. You need time. You need privacy. You need quiet. You need to go off on your own. Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I do. What about if it's the other way? What if you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert? Ooh, now we got a different problem because you're trying to put your hands on me, spend time with me, lean into my space, and I need space. I am not lonely, I just want to be alone. And do not bring those damn women from the church over, I'll knock them in the head. Because <laughs> they talk too much. If you're gonna come visit me, you need to learn how to be quiet. Let's just walk outside. Why must you run your mouth about everything we see? Can you not just walk quietly down a road? No. Well then, leave me alone and go home. Now what do you think? You think I'm being mean. No, what it is is I have dementia and I can't not do that. You really irritate me when you won't shut up. And what if I won't even talk about it? <laughs> Am I still talking about it? Yeah. Oh yeah, but I'm using visual when I don't have verbal. Your problem is you don't listen. And you keep coming, come back, come back. Pow! told you I was gonna slap the shit out of you and you came up anyway. <laughs> and this is where I've been trying to hint to you that I need alone time, I need downtime, I need to be in a place that's safe, but quit coming after me. But because y'all worry, 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 and you're extroverts, you think touching me is a good idea. I already told you, let me be. And then you're surprised when I smack you. Duh. I will also tell you the environment matters and you've gotta really be aware of the environment. Not only the little environment, but the big environment, the people environment, the activity environment, it matters for me. You want to match it to me, and when it's overwhelming, I could have a great outing with you. Absolutely have a fantastic outing. Have a wonderful time out. By evening, though, where is my son? Where is my son? What happened to my son? Mom, I'm right here. Not you! 
because in that moment I used up all my chemistry for the outing. I used it all. That was it. I have nothing left and now I'm running on empty. And my brain is even more than it usually is damaged. And so I look at you, my son, and I have not a clue who you are because I'm looking for a two-year-old in that moment. And I'm not satisfied. And this is not where I stay. And I need to go home. And this is where you get really frustrated with me because it was such a great day. And what you have to realize is maybe you need to cut down on the great and make it good and not use up quite so much so I have a little bit left for the evening. And this is hard because you can have great moments, but sometimes there's kickback on that. And you've got to sort of weigh that and realize a short visit that's good may be better than a long visit that, that wears me out. And so it's not just about what you need. It's so much about what I need. And you may be better off with a five-minute visit with me that goes well than an hour visit that wears me out. Because then there's the rest of the day to get through. Okay? I will also tell you medical conditions and sensory status. What else is wrong with me? Because on average, I have three other diagnoses. If I have dementia, it's not just dementia. I also have other things happening. I have arthritis. Diabetes. Diabetes. I may have problems with, with my blood pressure, hypertension, very, very common, cholesterol level. I may have problems with my kidneys. I may have problems with my prostate. I may have problems with a history of breast cancer. I may have low back pain. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities, and all of those impact how I behave and what happens to my brain, because I may be on numbers of medication. And we start adding those medicines into my brain, woo-wee, boy, do things get interesting. And then you have five docs, none of which are talking to each other. So you really need somebody who knows how to negotiate and make that work. And it may not be you. You may need somebody really smart to help figure that out. Because docs don't like to mess in each other's playground. So if you've got several different conditions, well, I don't want to change his med. You'll have to see that doc. So what happens is her heart's working really, really well. I mean, he's got that fine-tuned. That's looking good. But he never looks to see what's happening up here that might be impacted by the heart. And so now you can barely get her up and get her moving, but her heart's great, but you can't get her to do anything. Because what she's taking for her heart does affect her brain. We're cooked, connected together. It's not just separate pieces. I will also tell you, I talked about the whole day, and then the final piece of the puzzle is you and who else is around and how they're helping. So what I'm going to do, oops. Well, that was a bad idea. Who pushed that? Wish you'd quit messing with my equipment. Now, uh, don't say that. You're going to say, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I should not have messed with it. Who, you better quit messing with my equipment. I'm sorry. Say it loud. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. What? You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. Say oh, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Why do men have so much trouble with that phrase? <laughs> now the last phrase, I shouldn't have messed with your equipment. I shouldn't have messed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have messed with your equipment. Now, let's review this. Did he actually mess with my equipment? No. No, but he gave us both a way out. He said he shouldn't have. That's good enough for me. It makes it sound like he's okay, but he won't do it again. The fact of the matter is, he didn't do it to start with. He doesn't need to emphasize that. What he's, when I said, what'd you mess with this for? I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I shouldn't have messed with your equipment. He made it okay for both of us, and so I still like him. As opposed to, I didn't mess with your equipment. You're the one that touched it. I just got up here. I did not mess with it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mess with your equipment. Well, it's okay, but you just need to stay back there and not get involved with it. I want to walk somewhere. Smart ass. Okay, now realize he can cause trouble by what he chooses to say. He thinks he's clever, be careful. All right, so I'm gonna show you a couple pictures, just real quick. This is the chemistry of your brain. And then later on, y'all can ask more questions if you want. Um, this is called a PET scan. It's a research study type scan right now. It's still not available to the general public. However, it is in certain places, but not in the US right now. In the US, we're still just using other techniques like reviews and histories and CAT scans and MRIs kinds of things. 
What's different about a PET scan is it lets us live it, look at living human brains and it emphasizes the chemistry of the brain, not the structure. So what we're seeing in pictures is how well your brain is working, how well it's burning fuel. And red is an indicator of high chemical activity, good part of your brain working, working really well. Yellow is an indicator of some activity. And those dark blue kind of areas you're seeing are where you have fluid in your brain. And that's good, that's important. You should have fluid in your brain in the ventricles. That's where your brain gets cleaned with cerebrospinal fluid, it's good. Now this first column over here are two pictures of a normal brain. So these are two pictures of a brain. This comes from University of, Al of um, UCLA, Gary Small's work. He's doing a lot of work with PET scanning and sort of understanding PET scanning. All right, turn back on. I know you're frustrated with me. I left you off too long. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's good to know you're so trainable. I think before long you'll be good at this. That's good. There you go, good. Nice job. Now, just so you know, this is, it's a slice of brain we're looking at. So we're looking at a slice of brain and this is the front of the brain and this is the back. Front, back. And what we have is this top one is a slice sort of like this, and the second one down here is a slice at a diagonal. So we're looking at more variation on the brain. And this is the front, this is the back. Red indicates high level of chemical activity. These are the fluid areas. Same thing down here, fluid, high chemical activity. Because we've asked the person to solve a complicated problem. They're pretty busy. Early Alzheimer's, take a look. Wow, changes already, huh? Yeah, really important. Now, this is Alzheimer's, not other types of dementia, but in Alzheimer's, it has a pretty predictable pattern and, and array of function. 